And we are live here in Castle, Montana at the lovely Falcor Defense Facility. And, and uh, we are, just first off, behind the flame, but we want to thank our sponsors, the Kinsey's Optics, beautiful glass. Bank Energy, always keeping John on the up and up. That way he doesn't uh, fall short on things. Mm -hmm. 221, 221B Tactical. Mark Bell Slingshot, which is always great for keeping us uh, strong and steady in the gym. And Taurus. Excellent. Excellent revolvers. I suggest if you haven't fired one, I suggest you get one. That being said, we have a tremendous and remarkable guest here in our studio today. He is a uh, war veteran, just like myself, a very humble dude, always keeps his uh, head up and always strives to do what's best, always strives for perfection, and always just goes after it day in and day out. And with that being said, I want to introduce Omar Avila, a.k.a. Crispy. How you doing, sir? I'm good, brother. I'm good. Thanks for having me. So, you want to do the contest? We're going to do a contest. We'll give away a revolver. We are going We're to give away a revolver. Yeah, yeah. A little uh, Taurus Raging Bull 454, if anybody's interested. Hey, can, I, can I enter this? You could. <laughs> could. Derek, what's the rules? What do you want to do? How do you want to play it? Yeah. Can I win? What do you want to do for the revolver? <laughs> what do you want everyone to do? do I'll to make do? you make the call. Uh, You're the man in charge. What do I want everybody to do? Dude, this is... <laughs> Come on, don't choke on it. We'll, we'll, toss, in, we'll toss in a Falcor prize all right. pack. All right. In honor of Omar, we'll give away a 454 right. Casul. All right. So the, for the giveaway, so the, the usual suspects, right? So where are we at with the video? This is crazy. I can't hear myself because that's a delay. Um, so we're going to do, this time we've got uh, all of our audio feeds, right, that we haven't been given any love to. So you need to go to BehindTheFlame.com. Ooh. All right. On the home page, we have all of the different preferred networks that you can choose, whether that's Stitcher, Spotify, Spotify, Anchor, all that. All right. Go pick one, subscribe, and then I want you to post on the Behind the Flame Instagram page which one you subscribe to. We'll pick a winner from those comments on our latest post on Behind the Flame. Does that sound good, John? Is that going to work? Yeah, it sounds good. All right. Um, Sounds really good. I mean, if you're good with that, I'm actually texting Taurus now and letting them know. Uh, I'm going to see if they want to toss anything else in. Uh, else. And so there you go, guys. Everything's all in there. I'm seeing what else they want to do. Uh, who's in here? 23 people coming into the YouTube. Give those guys a minute. So a couple things on the introduction. He's fast becoming one of my favorite people to chat with. We spent some time last night over a latte <laughs> <laughs> and, and some desserts. Come on, man. You can't say that. Come on. <laughs> we spent some time last night over a latte shooting the shit, hanging out. And I haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with this guy. And he, he really kind of took me. And I know everybody, everybody overuses the fucking word humble. They overuse it. Would you say it's overused? It's overused. Yeah. So I spent some time with this guy, and he never once makes an excuse for anything. Even walking to the fucking restaurant. I've been around some divas. There's not a diva bone in his body. He's super humble, super chill. Spent a few hours chatting, shooting the breeze, walking around. One of the nicest, most genuine folks I've spent some time with in a while, to say the least. And we share a lot of mutual friends. And I'm really excited to have him up here and even more excited to have the opportunity to spend time with him on this show. And we're going to get into his story a little bit. And he's going to probably go deeper than maybe he's gone in the past with folks. And I think this is going to be really powerful. So I think we should dive right in and kind of almost um, hear his story, have that moment and go, in, go into his head a little bit. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning, Omar, and I, wanna, I want you to tell everybody about how this happened to you and what was going through your head and walk us through this whole thing. Yeah. The surgeries, everything. Yeah, man. Um, well, man, going back to 2007, um, you know, I was already in Iraq. I've been there for about 11 months, so... You know, I, we were very familiar with the, with the area, and at that time, um, you know, we got word from from, our, from President Bush that our um, deployment was going to get pushed from 12 to 15 months, just because we weren't making, um, you know, we, we come in and make a huge impact, 
and then at 12 months we were pulled out. So there wasn't enough time to address what was going on in the areas that we were at. So, you know, we figured 15 months would be a lot better. So, you know, we, we pushed deployment up to 15 months and it just wasn't us. It was the whole army. Mm -hmm. And um, at 11 months, you know, we, we, we should have been pulling out. We, we should have been um, in Kuwait somewhere, getting ready to go back to our unit, mm -hmm. which is in Germany. It was part of the, the Big Red One. And, you know, when we got word, we stopped everything and we continued to do patrols. So uh, May 14, 2007, just like any other day, we roll out and um, we're in a five vehicle convoy. I'm in the third vehicle. I was a gunner. Uh, and in my vehicle, there was five passengers. You have your driver, your, your truck commanders, your TC, myself and the gun. And we had two passengers in the back. And um, so we roll out and man, 6, 7.30 in the morning, an IED goes off. It hit the last vehicle. Nothing happened. All they did, it was, it blew out the spare tire in the back of the Humvee. So my buddy, um, which is my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, squad leader, hits me on the leg and he goes, hey, there's our alarm. Wake the fuck up. And I'm like, well, that's ahead of an alarm. All right, let's go. So we wake up, you know, I get woken up and we start patrolling and, and you know, we get going and, and we assess the situation. Nothing had happened. So we're like, all right, let's keep pushing forward. So we push forward. And around 7, 7.30 in the morning, the first vehicle receives arms, small arms fire from the left-hand side. So they start shooting at them. Mm -hmm. But at that point, first vehicle and second vehicle push forward. So they, were, they, they couldn't turn where the, fire, where the enemy fire was coming from. So as we're going, maybe in the third vehicle, we had a chance to turn. So we turn left. And I'm on my 50 cal, and, man, I see these guys shooting towards me, and, man, it just felt awesome. The adrenaline kicked in, and I'm like, here we go. I get behind my 50 cal, and I just start firing. Uh, I dropped a few of them, and as soon as we do that, I start dropping them, and, and everybody falls back into formation. As soon as that happens, we start getting attacked again from the left-hand side, so we all maneuver. As we maneuver towards the new enemy, um, we got baited. We got baited in. There's no other way to say it, man. We got baited in. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I've been there 11 months. We go over this bump. And as soon as we go over the bump, I'm trying to process what's going on. Because like I mentioned earlier, 11 months, I knew the area like the back of my hand. I knew exactly where we were at. I knew everything about that location. And there wasn't a bump there. So as I'm trying to process this bump, the, lo the loudest IED that I have ever heard goes off. And at this point, I've been blown up about 13 times, so this one was loud. And the guy behind us said the truck went up about five or six feet in the air. You're talking about, you know, one ton vehicle. So what had actually had happened was um, they dug a hole from one of the houses into the road and started packing it with explosives. So when we drove by, they set it off. One of the good things that day that happened is the guy panicked a little and he set it off about a second off and it ended up hitting the back of the Humvee opposed to hitting it right in the middle. If he would have hit it in the middle, every single one of us would have been dead that day. Sets it off, vehicle was up in the air, vehicle comes back down, uh, my legs give out, you know, I'm in the gunner, I'm standing up. And I fall down, and I fell down to the right-hand side where Harky was. And that's where the IED had gone off. And, man, I remember just laying there, and I was looking at Harky, and I can see Harky's eyes, and, and they were white. Harky was dead. He was killed on impact. And as I do that, I, you know, I roll over, and I looked at the other way, and I can see um, Catterton, which was the driver, and Fleming was in the back. Both of them jumped out. And we're running towards the back of the convoy, and it was so so slow yet so fast. And I can see them running in flames, and some of our guys put them out. And the flames were too heavy in our truck, so they couldn't really get too close. And uh, as I'm laying there, man, Campos, which is the the, the, TC, the TC, the truck commander, kind of reaches over and grabs me, and he's um, he's telling me to get out. He's like, "You need to get out. You need to get out." Um, he couldn't get out because his equipment was melted into the Humvee, into the seat, so he couldn't get out himself. And he's telling me to get out, to get out. And I looked at him and I said, man, I'm done. You know, I was like, in our world is either you come home alive or you don't. There was no, you know, you can get wounded and come home and live somewhat of a normal life. That was not in my job description. 
So, you know, making peace with God at this point, we have lost about 14 guys and I had lost faith in God. You know, I was just in bad terms with God and, um, you know, my faith wasn't all there. So as I was laying there in flames all around me, I started making peace with God. I asked him, you know, to forgive me for everything that I had done to take care of my mom. Um, I was worried about my mom a lot because I knew she was going to be affected by it very hard. And uh, my dad served, so I knew my dad was going to take it okay. And uh, so, you know, I asked God to please look after my mom, to you know, just take care of her because I know how cruel this world can be. And, you know, take care of my sister and my brother. Let my brother be, you know, the, the older um, sibling now since so I was going to be gone. And as I'm, as I'm doing this, man, I had this inner light inside of me that just kind of came over me, just... Something kind of peeked over and just grabbed me and said, not today. This is not where you die. Get up and get on your gun. And I rose up and till today, man, I credit God 100%. I got up on that gun and I started shooting the enemy. There was enemy on the rooftop, started shooting. Um, the truck got too hot because of the fire and rounds started cooking off. And at that point, I knew it was time to get out. And the little small window that I gave the guys with suppress the fire, they were able to pull compost out. So they pulled him out, and I knew that, you know, it was time for me to get out of the Humvee. So as I did, you know, I'm getting out of out of the hatch, and a grenade goes off. Like we had extra grenades and extra ammunition in my truck. So it just peppers my whole right side. And as I'm doing that, I said, oh, shit, I need to get out. So as a gunner, you're taught to go from the gunner's hatch into the uh, where the engine's at or in the back. So I looked towards the engine and it's all on fire. So if I would have jumped there, I would have gone straight down with the Humvee and that would have been it. You know, I would have been dead. Same thing in the back. And my only option was to jump to the side. And at this time, you know, I'm in flames and I'm like, okay, this is my only option. So I jumped to the side. When I jumped down, I break both my legs. Both of my femurs just break. And uh, I remember being there, man. And, and I remember I was in the ground and I was still on fire and I remember Shit, stop, drop, and roll. Well, if I ever meet the guy that invented it, I'm going to sue his ass because it doesn't work. It does not work. So finally, one of our guys came over, saw me on the ground, put me out with a fire extinguisher, and he's like, hold on, I'll be right back. Well, at this point, we had 30 to 40 guys coming to finish us off. They were, they were ready to finish every single one of us off. And uh, we got lucky that there was two Black Hawks in our vicinity and saw the smoke of the IED come up. So they're like, well, what was that? Let's go check it out. So they flew by and man, it felt like I was in Black Hawk Down because these guys saw what was going on. They make comms with the guys on the ground. And next thing you know, I just, you know, I just hear that the freaking gun on, on the uh, Black Hawk just and I'm like, holy shit. And there's brass falling everywhere. They, they took all those guys out. They, they saved their lives that day. And at that point, I'm sitting there looking at the rooftop. And I had managed to grab my M4 when I jumped off. And there was guys on the rooftop, so I'm just shooting. And I run out of ammo. I have nothing else. I'm pretty much naked on the ground. And I'm laying there, and one of my guys happens to run by. And he's like, hey, are you alive? And I just looked up, and I was like, I think so. And he's like, we got to get you out of here. And I was like, okay. So he picks me up. But before he picks me up, I looked at him. I was like, dude, I think my legs are broken. Um, you know, just be careful. And he looks up at me. He goes, no, you're fine. And I said, okay. So he picks me up. I put all most of my weight on him. You know, at this time, I'm like 240, 230, 235, 240. And, and you know, I said, all right, dude, I'm going to put my weight on you. So I put my weight on him, and he gets me to the next zombie. When the IED went off, uh, we had another I, uh, another vehicle go in front of it and set up um, – um, a perimeter in front of it to make sure that no one was coming this way. And so he walks me to the first Humvee and he goes, man, I'm going to let you, I'm going to need to let you go. I got to open the door. And I said, okay, that's fine. So he opens the door. And as he opens the door, he lets me go. These doors are like 500 pounds when they're up armored. So he needs both hands. And as he does, I'm standing there and all my weight goes back on my femurs and they just break. And I remember just seeing him, the Humvee, and I fell back and he hovers over me and he goes holy shit and I dude I said dude I think uh I think I told you my legs are broken and he just you know was in shock and 
the adrenaline was so high in my body that I couldn't feel the pain. You know, I could not feel anything. So what he decides to do is he puts me inside a Humvee, a medic jumps in, medic starts working on me, and um, the driver that we had was brand new to the platoon. Like I told you earlier, we had lost about 14 guys, so we were getting replacements. And um, that guy was his first day in, in theater, first day outside the wire, first everything. And he was scared, you know. I, 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 could, I would never blame him. He was scared. And um, I just reached over, grabbed him, slapped him in the face, and I said, shut the fuck up. Come down. Give me the headset. Gives me the headset. I call out company until, I mean, I got three wounded. I got two dead. And um, we need to get out. And I need a, a, a medevac. And, you know, they're relaying back and forth. They're like, okay, we got you guys. We're waiting on you as soon as you get in. And while this is going on, man, I just get thirsty. I'm like, I am freaking thirsty. I need some water. And I look over at the medic, and I was like, hey, man, give me some water. And as he's hooking me up with an IV and stuff, he's like, I can't give you any water right now, dude. He's like, you're, you're too badly burned. You know, you're super dehydrated. I can't give you any water right now. And uh, I looked at him, and I just said, I outrank you. Give me some fucking water. <laughs> and he did. And uh, I made the mistake of not only drinking it, but I poured it over my face because that was so hot. And um, all the chemicals, all the dirt, all the crap you can think in Iraq just fell out of my eyes, and I went blind. I couldn't see for a little bit. And um, at that moment, I knew that there was two things that I can do. I can panic, or I can stay calm and guide this guy back because he doesn't know where we're at. It's his first day here. And we're in the front of the convoy. And if I mess up, more people are gonna die, I'm gonna die. So I remain calm, and I, I clearly remember where we were at, and I said, I know how to get us back. So I started giving him uh, instructions. Once everybody came on the radio and said they were, they were good to go, we can push, we can push. You know, I tell him, all right, let's go. I said, you know about 300 meters, so you're gonna see a house in this corner. I was like, it's a pink house. Turn on that, on that corner, so he turns. And for some reason, man, I always remember this house. And outside of the house, it had a huge bell. For some reason, they had a bell outside of their house. And I knew that if you were to take a right and shoot straight ahead from that house, you can see our cop. So I told him, I was like, hey, you're going to see this bell? And he's like, I see it. I said, take a right, haul ass. Let me know when we're about 100 yards from, from the gate. And he goes, we're, in the, we're almost to the gate. And I call out the company. I said, open the gates, open the gates. We're coming through. So we roll in. And as we roll in, um, I remembered that there was only three medics in, in there and we needed, we needed all three. And as we're doing that, and um, one of the guys opens the door, when he opened the door, he grabbed me to pull me out. And as he did, all my skin just fell off my arms. Like it just peeled off and he's freaking out. And I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> that's crazy. Finally gets me out. They put me in inside um, the aid station. They start working on me. And um, I see my other guys coming in, and um, you know I, I looked at them and I was like, "Hey man, I see you guys when we we'll wake up." And uh, Campos was like, "Campos couldn't speak." Campos just looked at me and nodded, and I said, "Okay." And next thing I know, they're putting them back in the Humvee. We're going to the uh, landing zone so we can get you know taken out of there and into the green zone. And uh, that was one of the last times I saw Campos. We flew into the green zone, and as soon as we flew into the green zone, I remember trying to reach to touch him. I couldn't touch him. And then I saw Fleming and Catterton come in, and you know, at that point I was like, okay, we're gonna be all right. And um, don't remember anything after that. We got flown into San Antonio, Brook Army Medical Center. This was May 14th, May 16th, and here in the States, as we were already in the hospital in San Antonio, and unfortunately, June 1st, after he had both arms amputated, both legs, um, and he was severely burned inside his intestines, Campos passed away. Um, I wasn't awake for it. I was in an induced coma for about three and a half months. Um, so I was told afterwards. And then, um, man, as a result of that, um, I sustained 75% burns to the body, third and fourth degree burns, and then had the leg amputated uh, below the knee on the right side. Holy shit. And, and that's it. <laughs>
I don't know how we follow that. <laughs> All I gotta say, man, is I love you. From Thanks, the brother. Um, uh, sounds like you and I were in Iraq about the same time frame. I was there from uh, July 06 to uh, November 07. Really? Where at? Uh, Saladin province, so Beji, oil refinery, that area. Uh, we were not a Mia, so yeah. I was closer to like Souter like City. Souter City. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, my platoon actually got attached to different units in uh, 30th Tamus and uh, Bakuba during that during that deployment. Really? Yep. Yeah. The the uh, so the place that we took over was Aramia. It was the last place that Saddam had been seen before he went into hiding, and um, I think it was first AD that actually killed the two remaining sons that Saddam had left in that palace that we took over. Yeah. That was probably one of the most powerful stories I've heard in this room, hands down, if not the most. Absolutely. No doubt about it. So without, you know, I know there's a lot of time that passes in there. Yeah. What do you go through emotionally after? And I know we had, <coughs> we had Andy Stump in here, a good mutual friend of ours. Yep. You know, and he talks about, we talk a lot about PTS, PTSD, he doesn't like to use the D. Um, you know, what is your thought process as you come out of the coma? And what do you go through? Is there a feeling of like, fuck the world, fuck the arm? Like, what do you go through? What, you know, kind of give me some insight into that. Not necessarily like fuck the world, fuck the army. None of that ever, ever kicked in. It was more of, I felt like I had let my teammates down and I was no longer part of the fight and I wasn't there. So I... I was very hard on myself because I knew the area that we were in. I knew that they needed me there. Uh, I need to be there. So it was a lot, a lot of, it was, I imposed it on myself. I was like, I need to be there. I felt, I felt like I was doing my team and injustice not being there. I think you did them a lot of justice. I think you do them a lot of justice now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you, I mean, you gotta understand at, at that time, it, it's, you know, you, you go through that and that's the first thing that goes through your mind. You feel like you, you've let your whole team down because you're no longer there. Yeah, Jason's jumping on the mic. He wants to add something. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an incredible story. I agree with you, John. I haven't heard anything like that in a long, long time. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. It can't be, can't be easy to always talk about it. Um, you know, I, I got in really good at it over the years just because Every time that I'm that I share my story, believe it or not, I already dumped it on you. So you're carrying my story now. So now you you, you got to carry that burden with you. So you're helping me unload, and, and you know now you're gonna have Campos and Harky's name embedded in your head. So that's a way of me keeping their memory alive, and, and telling the story of my guys and the, and, the, and what we went through. You know now more people are aware of it. So. It's not hard at all, man. And actually, I look forward to it every single time because I'm able to, to, to just share it with the world. I got a question. Uh, when you were talking about the moment you were praying, I, I, I'm fascinated. First of all, I'm a Christian, and I'm sure you are. And you said you kind of fell out of grace a little bit there prior. Yeah. And then it's amazing how at that moment, all those questions you you put aside, and while you're there with your life hanging in the balance, that you actually took the time to think about your faith a little bit. Do you think you've ever thought about why you lived during that time? Uh, like now, during or, that or, moment, or during like, that moment. Yeah, why? Why you? Why did you? Why did you live? And the guys around you died. Did you think you had a greater purpose? I don't, at that moment, I didn't really think of anything because it was, it was so chaotic of the stuff that was going on. But afterwards, yeah, there, there's a lot of survivor's guilt. There, there's that guilt of why me? You know, I was, I'm a single guy. I didn't have a family. I wasn't married. didn't have anything, no kids, nothing. And my best friend married kids, and he's no longer here. So that was one of the hardest things was why me? And, and it's, it's hard for it to present itself or, or develop itself in front of you when you're freshly wounded. You know, nothing's going to happen. Like, you don't get in an accident, lose a leg, and, you know, two days later you're running a marathon. That's not the way it happens. It, 
it takes a long, long time for you to overcome an obstacle and then for that light to shine upon you and be like, this is why. So it, it took a lot, a lot of time. It took a lot of years for, for it to finally develop to where I understood why I was here, why I'm here, and, and why is it that I do what I do. So it, it, it took a long time for to actually for me to realize and be at a level where I, I am at church faster than most of my friends and realize that, man, life's a beautiful thing and I'm here for a reason. I'm not gonna waste it. I'm gonna spread this positive message with the rest of the world and I'm gonna try to make the world a better place by the time that I'm gone. I want this place to be a little bit better than it was when I got here. So you think, um, based on what I, I'm hearing, I think you know, there was a greater purpose for you. Look what you're doing now. Look what, look what the message you're sending and uh, the hardships that you went through and uh, continue to go through based on you're still having surgeries and things like that. Uh, I think God had a greater purpose, and I can see just by talking to you and getting to know you better that, uh, you know, you take a, a moment like that and, and make the best out of it tell your story so you can impact everyone around you and uh, I praise you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's well said. I mean so you go through this this little period <clears throat> after and you're kind of refocusing, repurposing your life I would think, you know, kind of figuring out what the next step is. Yeah. Tell me kind of, and maybe this is a little bit of advice for other veterans out there and, and folks that have been through some level of disability, maybe, maybe not on your level, of course, but take me through kind of that mindset of kind of sitting around and saying, now what's the next thing? Do you just go get a regular job? I mean, how does this well, I mean, for me, just get back in the saddle? What's You definitely got to get back in the saddle. But for me, it was, um, I, I found an outlet to, to let all my aggression out, to let all that disappointment out and I was getting out of weight. I mean, I was getting super big and I wasn't doing anything. I was sitting at home playing Xbox all day, going to therapy, checking in because I was still active duty and that was it. I, I had nothing, dude. I was just like, what am I doing? So I finally went home, um, small town in Brownsville, Texas, South Texas, and a buddy of mine had opened a um, strength and conditioning gym and, you know, I said, you know, I need to get in there. Let's go check it out. I'm here for the weekend. Why not? So I walk in there and they were deadlifting that day. And um, I got intimidated because of my hands. I didn't think that I was going to deadlift. I was like, I can't deadlift. Mm. This is crazy. So I worked myself up to like 225. And then after that, I was losing grip. And I said, I, I, I'm done. I looked at my buddy. I was like, hey, I can't do any more. And he goes, no, hold on goes and gets straps some straps yeah put some straps in and you know everybody that lifts one in one out yep. i did lift both hands in mm -hmm. and um he straps me up and <laughs> i maxed out at 405 the first day i was there and uh i said you know what oh man i like this and you can probably attest to this man that iron bug bit me yeah, of course. It's. I mean, the only <laughs> thing that rivals the gun bugs, the iron bug. Jason yeah. has it now. He's severely addicted. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I came in the following week, and uh, I did lifted 500 pounds the following week. And next thing I knew, you know, I was benching like four or five. And I was just, everybody in the gym was like, what? Like, how are you doing this? And I couldn't even explain it myself. So that took off, and that's kind of where I got into the fitness industry. I started doing that, and then... Um, I never once competed uh, in the Paralympic world. I was always competing against able bodies, as, you know, the normies is what we call them. <laughs> and uh, I was I was out deadlifting, out benching a lot of guys that been around for a while. And were you doing raw or equipped? Oh no, I was raw. raw. What uh, were your maxes? Uh, I deadlifted seven hundred five, and I benched five hundred. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I got I got challenged by a friend, and he told me to uh, to do a competition for wobble and the wobble, and, um, and I did, and I broke every single war record for disabled category one and two, 
and uh, till today they haven't been broken. And that was a couple of years ago, and I just haven't gone back. But you know, due to the surgeries and all that stuff, that kind of slowed down for a while. You know, now I just do it more of recreation. I really don't do it competitively. But you know, along all that, um, hunting, hunting came in, in a very, very huge part of my life. Um, just being in the outdoors, having a gun in my hand, and being one with nature was really soothing, therapeutical, and, and it was very helpful for me. And we, you know, we'll, we'll get, we're going to get deep into the hunting, but we share a mutual friend in the in the fitness world. Uh, he worked with Mark Bell for a little while, Slingshot. Obviously, we're huge fans of them here. Yeah, they're awesome guys. And, yeah, great guys. And... Um, you know, you really, you understated a little bit. You did a lot in that community for, for a while, and, and the records speak for themselves. I mean, those are good numbers for anybody in push-pull. <laughs> so, I mean, that goes without saying, especially raw, and I can't stress to people, raw means no equipment, and in most federations, it means nothing. No wraps, nothing. Nothing. So, you're doing that raw. Now, the hunting comes in, and I'm glad you kind of went there, you walked around here, you've had the tour, you've seen the facility, you got to see everything. We couldn't, I know Jason kind of rolled up on you and you were staring at some of Mel's hunts, some of Melinda's hunts. And <laughs> yeah, you were jealous. like, you're like, yeah, man, you know, you're cool. I'll get back to you. Let me look at this bear. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Jason's standing there and I'm standing there and I think he was over there. And I was admiring her Rams. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, fucking guy, you know, and, and you're just staring at her. You love hunting and I you do. love game i do i do it's man it's just where like does that come from are you just going to pull the texas card or where does that come from <laughs> <laughs> everything's bigger yeah, yeah, hunting. everything's better in texas um no you know growing up in south texas man all that you know if we look forward to every year dove hunting dove hunting is is a way to kick open and start hunting season and it's something that everybody does you know you go out of a field in brownsville you sit around your truck you know you grab a shotgun a beer and you know, you shoot some dove and cook them. Don't up. say the beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, water, Kool Aid, Kool Aid. Yeah, and um, you know, you you, you 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 meet with people that you haven't seen in a while, and your neighbors, and everybody is just kind of one of those things. And and hunting always brings me back to that, to mm. to a much simpler time, to where nothing else in the world matters at that moment but you, your gun, and what you're hunting, because you got to be in tune with yourself and with your weapon to make a clean ethical kill. You know, you, you just can't go out there and shoot something in the back and watch it suffer forever. You want to make a clean kill. So that helped me out a lot, being able to just shut everything else out in the world and just make it about me, my weapon, and the animal. You're downplaying this, though. You know, you're talking about doves. You've done some major hunts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, talk about a couple of them. Um, man, the, the most memorable that I've done is um, water buffalo. Um, I was able to, and this was bow hunting. Um, I got in within 35 yards of a water buffalo <laughs> and uh, drew back and smacked it, went about 10 yards, tipped over, and then my camera guy and I were extremely afraid for our lives because she was with two bulls that charged us and we had to climb on trees to avoid being killed <laughs> by the bulls. So, um, yeah, that's a memorable, memorable hunt. Um, that's insane. That yeah, is insane. yeah. So stuff like that. Um, I got to go to Alaska and hunt with my father. Um, you know, we, we grew up very, very, um, not very poor, but, you know, we, we, we made it. We made it by, and um, you know, me and my father had never really, really hunted. What did your dad together. do for work? Um, he he, work, just... he works in the border. Um, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, he does stuff in the border to keep other people out. Um, and uh, so he got to go to Alaska with me. We were on moose hunting, and man, just having my dad by my side and helping me out and, and walking with me and enjoying Alaska. And then when we were able to harvest the, a moose, you know, we had a moment where. Him and I were just, you know, very, very in tuned. Um, you know, I've been, I've been always been close to my father and my mother, but that just brought my dad and I a lot closer. And um, it was a fun experience, man. We were up there for a week, and uh, we ended up getting the moose the day before we had to fly out. So it was, you know, we were experiencing sweat and, and 
kicking their ass and, and you know we got to stay outdoors i mean the whole night man it was just a great great experience and it was just you know a guy's trip and loved it man loved it and you know i got a lot of memorable hunts that i've done with a lot of people i've, I've had the pleasure of taking kids that have lost their fathers overseas and i would never ever say that i can replace their fathers or take their, their father's spot but just taking those kids out and watching them kill a deer and see how excited they are. And, and, and the moment right then and there, you know, you, you feel like the dad's around and then you f it's just watching them and the smile, man. It just, it brings peace and joy and everything else you can think of to see them experience it. And one of the biggest ones that, that touched me, man, and I didn't realize when we did it that I was crying when he took the shot, but Campo's son, my TC that, got killed I took his son hunting for the first time and put him on a buck and he was just static and happy you know it was first time hunting and mm -hmm. I remember a compost that told me he was he wanted to take him hunting when he got back home and obviously you know he never got the chance and I got to take him and you know I was coaching I was like squeeze 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 makes a great kill and as I'm doing all this my buddy who was next to me just keeps patting me and I'm like what are you patting me for you know like get off me and I was just bawling like I was didn't even realize that I was just crying dude. like it was just pouring and I was like whoo and I, I stepped back and I was like this is something that I need to do this is something that I got to share with everybody that I meet and and tell them how therapeutic this is for me and and, and it's just man I there's so many things behind hunting dude that are so great there's so many amazing people in this industry that that I just just love I, I, I couldn't agree more and how you're describing everything is is for lack of a better word beautiful yeah um, I can I can totally relate especially hunting with your dad um, I got my first cow elk with my dad nice and I cried like my dad was like are you all right I'm like I'm just super <laughs> excited and to yeah. be able to exp you know have that experience with with the old man and like you said it, it brought us closer yeah for sure and it's not something that you really think about overseas you know no. while you're deploying at all I mean all you're, all you're thinking about is just get through the day, yeah. and you know, time kind of stops still for us. It, I, some people can't can't really explain it all that well, and I have a hard time kind of explaining it. But you know, we tend to think that everything back here is the norm. Like, yeah. we come back and everything's going to be the, the exact same, and it's actually the the opposite. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the same goes for families back here thinking that for us it's going to be the same. And you know, there's there, there's that uh, that that contrasting parallel that comes into play, yeah. you know, when we, when we come back and, and try to reintegrate with our families and our friends. And some of us do it a lot better of trying to re, you know, reintegrate with, you know, the civilian, the civilian family friend life, whereas, you know, some guys, you know, struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have definitely picked yourself up and just rolled with it. You just grabbed life by the, by the horns and just ran with it. Well, it's, like, awesome. it's like we talked a little while ago, man. It, it, it's, I, I can't fully take 100% credit of me taking it and rolling. Like I, I've had such a great um, group of people behind me. I've had so many people that were very supportive. My mom, my dad dropped everything, moved to San Antonio to take care of me. So my support system has been amazing since day one. So. They were, the, they were the group of people that didn't allow me to quit, didn't allow me to feel sorry for myself, never let me make excuses because something was hurting. They're the ones that pushed me every single day and said, listen, life's, life's tough, mm -hmm. but if you roll over, you're done. Right. And um, I, I refuse to be that person, man. That's not the way my parents raised me. You know, it's just, it's, it's with anything, man. It, it didn't necessarily have to be that I was injured in war. I'm pretty sure if something else would have happened, you know, in a car accident or something, every it would have been the same today. And right. that's what I tell people. One of the biggest things that when I when I speak, um, a lot of people tell me I could have never done what you did, and I refuse to accept that because in that moment, no matter who you are, what your background is, we as humans want to survive. That that's what we're wired to do. We want to survive. You want to live. And you're going to do anything you can to fight and survive. And I tell people, if you were put in my situation, I guarantee you 100% you would do the same thing and you would be sitting in my shoes right now telling the same story. I was Absolutely. like, don't ever sell yourself short. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to um, thank everyone on YouTube. I know a lot of questions have been coming in. Anything, Austin, that 
that's notable. I know a lot of uh, how inspirational you are. Not too many questions right now. Yeah, people, a lot of congratulations, a lot of people saying, you know, well wishes. Uh, Thank and, you. So, and to all those folks on YouTube, we are giving away some stuff, so pay attention to the rules, Austin. I'll type those up. I want to. I want to kind of get into, for, for a quick second, maybe there's a little comedy here. <laughs> you, you, you start social media. Yeah. I'm going to ask the obvious question. <laughs> Where does the name Crispy come from? <laughs> I'm going to make you say it. So, I, I, dude, I'll, I'll retract. So, three, <laughs> three years after I, or sorry, not three years, um, seven months after I've been wounded, um, you know, my unit's back in Germany. Uh, they're getting ready to do the welcome back ceremony. And we get invited. And I had to go through hell to make to make it possible. Because the doctors were like, you're still severely wounded. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere, especially overseas <laughs> to Germany. It's a 13-hour flight. Like, you know, and then I don't know if people don't know this, but Germany's not ADA compliant at all. I mean, right. it's, it's horrible. <laughs> and... Um, so I fought it, fought it, and they finally said yes. And I was like, sweet. And I feel bad because one of our guys couldn't make it. He was he was pretty bad and had test surgeries and stuff, and he couldn't make it. Um, so only two of us made it. So we get back to Germany, um, and this is kind of where rank plays in. And we had two bunch of brand-new privates. And I was still in a wheelchair, so I made two privates carry me upstairs to the third floor and another one carrying my wheelchair. And uh, we get to the third floor, and there was another buddy of mine named Werda, who had been wounded, uh, ID went off, uh, nothing struck him, nowhere, except a little piece of metal went through his side, out the other, and went completely blind. And um, I'm sitting there talking to a bunch of the guys, and from across the room, he was able to recognize my voice, and he comes over, and he's like, Avila? And I'm like, where the, what's up, brother? And he's like, oh, not much. He's like, I heard what happened to you. And he's like, yeah, me too. And he goes, check this out. Takes his glasses off and he goes, I'm the only Filipino with one blue and green eye. And he had fake eyes and I just started cracking up. And then he's like, well, what ended up happening to you? You know, I was like, he's like, I know how you got hit, but I didn't know what happened. I was like, well, you know, I got burned 75% of the body and and uh, the leg and stuff. And he goes, well, shit, you're crispy, huh? And then I was like, I like that. So <laughs> since that day, man, I, you know, it, it, it's kind of an icebreaker when you meet somebody and then they're very intimidated by the scars because they're, they're, they're noticeable. It's not like they're not there. You, right. know? you can see them in my hands and my face everywhere. And when you introduce yourself as crispy, there's like that sense of relief, like, like, okay, I, I got it. Like this is, it's okay. So I just kind of saw how that played out and that whole weekend and the whole time we were there everybody was like crispy crispy it wasn't like it wasn't sarna villa anymore it was crispy and i was like i'm cool with that and i just that that's where it came from it's a very cool nickname right <laughs> i had to get the story the backstory on it um yeah, yeah. i don't think i've told that to many people actually so. it's a it's a it's a falcor exclusive uh -huh. yes it is it's a behind the flame exclusive. You heard it here first. first. Yeah, yeah. here first. Yeah. I don't know how I feel behind the flame. Um, <laughs> this thing behind me is good. <laughs> <laughs> this thing behind me kind of bringing back memory. Well, um, you're, you're behind the flame. You're not in the flame. So, so you get on social media and you go by crispy and things start happening as yeah. I can imagine. And we'll get into you know your relationship and Black Rifle. And all that, uh, things start happening for you, and like everybody else, and and you told us this in the other room. It was crazy. Even you dealt with haters. Yeah, yeah. Man, it was you know started social media. Um, never in a million years that I think it was going to turn into what it's turned into today. Um, I just started it like any anybody else, and I was just sharing videos of me in the gym and and hunting and shooting guns and. Things that I loved. It was never, um, I started a social media and all of a sudden I see what caters to everybody else. So I'm going to become this person and start like, oh, I'm a patriot. I'm this, I'm that. I shoot guns. I'm fun. No, like, no, like everything that I do is stuff that I, that I thoroughly enjoy to do every single day. That's my background is who I am. And a lot of people found it inspiring a lot of people wanted to see what I was doing and it just kind of took off and it was it was kind of weird at first because I didn't know how to take it you know like 
I get recognized here and there, and I was just like, uh, you know who I am? Like, mm, and people are like, yeah, you, they follow you, and I'm like, oh, that's weird, and you know, eventually you get used to it, and as you start to grow, th there's envy. Mm -hmm. there, there's always. always there's always envy from people, mm -hmm. and um, when I got wounded, um, my right leg had been amputated. Just they had amputated half of my foot, and um, they amputated half of the foot because they had found cancer in it from all the chemicals and stuff overseas, and um, lived with it for nine years then i did a road march with some friends um it was like this you know stop the the 22 suicide stuff and so i went and did it and i overdid it and that wound opened up on my foot and you know i knew it wouldn't care i mean obviously at this point it's been nine years into in, into my uh, injury and i've done everything you can think of when it comes to the medical world so i had Painkillers. I had stuff to, to to put bandages on my leg. Everything. So I I did um, self care on, on my wounds and six months and it wasn't closing. And I was like, ah man, I need to go see a doctor. And uh, so I walk in and he's like, yeah, you need surgery. That's not gonna close. And I was like, damn it. So next thing I know, we have surgery. And when I come out of surgery. Doctors like, um, hey, we found cancer in your foot, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, we found cancer in your foot, and I was like, okay. He's like, we're gonna have to take it out, and I said, all right, let's do it. So they went in, and they took so much fat and tissue and everything out of there. Then when they closed it, the first step that I took, everything popped open, and it wasn't healing. It wasn't healing, and I said, man, this this is this is not gonna work. So I, I got to a point where I was very stressed out and the doctors walked in and they're just standing there and I was like, cut it off already. Cut the damn thing off. Like, I, I don't want it. And they're like, well, that's what we're going to talk to you about. I said, it's fine. If it's going to give me a better quality of life, cut the damn thing off. So they did. And uh, man, the biggest hate that I caught from doing that was, because at that point is when my social media was taking off, was people were saying that. I cut the leg off for social media because I wanted attention, because I wanted to keep growing. I did it for the followers, and I was just like, <laughs> all I can do is laugh. I was yeah. like, are you serious? I was like, you, get people, you people are the stupidest people I've ever heard. And it's just people that wanted to work with the companies that I was working with, the people that I'm involved with. And, and, and I don't know, for some reason, you know, they, they, they hate on what I got going on, and, and that's fine. It's, it's just part of, part of the. Of, and, and I ask everyone this: How do you deal with haters, personally? I ignore them. <laughs> I ignore them, dude. It's just one of those things. I'm not gonna take the time out of my day to address somebody that has all day to be on social media. Like that's, that's all they do. They breathe, live social media, and if their social media is gone, they're nobody. Like at the end of the day, if my social media is gone, dude, I can go back to motivational speaking. I, I I'm. I mean, I I can run CNC machines. I, I can build guns. I mean, there, there's so much to my resume. I can fall back to something and get a, a regular nine to five. I'm not depending on social media to keep me afloat or anything. I mean, it really. I'm not. It, it is not something that. It is not an even employment, man. It doesn't keep me employed or anything. It's just like I don't really. If it was gone, it's fine. But I love that I have it. I mean, I'm able to use it. But to me. Those people aren't worth my time. I got things to do. I got, I got. You mean social media is not real life? <laughs> what is it? Social media is like 10% of what I do throughout the whole day. And, and, and it's just like, if you ignore those people and, and you let them, um, if you let them in and then you go back and forward, that's what they want. That's, that's what they want. That, that feeds to them and they keep at it and at it and at it. And, and if you ignore them and you're like, hey, dude, I'm out. That bothers him more. I always refer to it as the ability to process attention. <laughs> yeah. There's certain people that they don't know the correct ways to put themselves out there or they don't know how to garner. They don't understand self-worth at all. No. And they don't understand that there's some people out there that just want to put something out there. You want to follow, hit follow. But I said this to you last night and we talked about it. The mistake a lot of people make on social media is they don't understand how powerful it is when they hit follow on someone's account. Yep. That is going to influence you all 
the time. You're yeah. getting inundated with that. If you follow shit, you're going to feel like shit. If you mm -hmm. follow inspirational stuff, you're going to feel inspired. If you follow miserable people, you're going to probably be fucking miserable. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to, you know, be very careful who you hit like to, who you hit follow. There are, like, we've talked about this before, and we talked about it with Tony. There are whole pages and whole YouTubes dedicated to pe putting people down. Yeah. Yeah, it, you get those pages that all they do is troll and, and, and make up things and, and, you know, Photoshop pictures. And, and it's just like, dude, why? Like, do you have not the nails better going on in your life? Like, do you really... What are you going to gain from this? 20 years from now, when you're sitting in your front porch dying, like, are you really going to go back and be like, oh, that, meme no, was, and, and, and that meme was awesome. It's, like, it changed somebody's life. Like, it's no. so powerful to hear you say it because you're living such an inspired life and you've had so much happen to you. And to hear you say that, it, it brings it you know, home. There's just so many people that just shut it down. Live a good life. Live your best life. Stop trying to live vicariously through... Aaron or Jason or Ilya or whoever yeah. else, just live your life. Go do your thing and put it out there. Don't live a life dedicated towards somebody else. Well, I think that's what's that's what's wrong with social media nowadays. I think that's what people look forward to, and they feel that if they're able to put somebody down on the internet, that makes their day. You know, cyberbullying it's a real thing, and some people pe feed off of it. I mean. The, you got 50 year old guys who have nothing else going on in their lives and they're 50 year old child that take social media that serious and want to put other people down and get involved in other people and start digging in. And then I was like, I know this about you. I knew that about, and it's just like, dude, why don't you just live your life and not worry about everybody else? Like, is it that important to you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think for some people and I can, I, I always, <laughs> I always pick on myself you know, I, I think it's added to the intrigue. I think more people want to meet me to form their own opinion yeah. than, than anything else. So it's kind of backfired on a lot of haters, I, I think. But, I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, you know, I, I think it's exactly what you said. Give them no air cover. Yeah. Just ignore them. <laughs> dude, that's what I do ever since. And then just block them, dude. That, Except block. That, that bothers them the most. Like, yeah. Oh, you're going to talk smack. Okay, bye. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to engage with this. Yeah, Tony said something similar. Uh, so you have the hunting. You have you had done the stint in fitness. What else are you passionate about? Who inspires you? Who do you look at? This I'm really curious about. Who do you look at and you say, because, <laughs> I mean, you're inspiring enough for this, you know, the, everything. I mean, for everybody in here, for sure. Who do you look at and you say, damn, I really like how he's doing it. And everybody brings up the rock, so I'll give you an easy one, you know, but... He does a great job. I'm not going to say not him. Um, to me, it is not no. Um, I'm not looking at celebrities. I'm not looking at athletes. I'm not looking at another athlete. Like, I got friends who who don't have legs and arms. And like I told you earlier, you know, we get to FaceTime. Mm. And dude, just seeing them smile and loving life and, and, and sharing with me that they just had a new kid and how amazing it is. And, you know, that inspires me. People that have that start businesses from nothing and turn it into an empire and then they give back and they love what they do and, and, and are just amazing at it. That's what inspires me. Like my father and my mother inspire me, dude. My, my, my dad came here illegally, brought my mom here illegally. And I don't know if people know this, but I wasn't born here. I was born in Mexico. I came here when I was nine years old, got my citizenship when I was a sophomore in high school, two weeks before nine 11. And not ones that I see my parents take any government assistant, not ones that I see them bitch. My mom used to work the fields in South Texas in the mud picking shrimp to get paid uh, for every pound that she picked of shrimp. That's what she got paid at the end of the day. So I have so many influential people in my life that inspire me a single day for me not to go out there and kill it and be all that I can be. And, and everything that I do is in the memory of the men and the women that fought next to me. So why am I not going to be inspired? Why am I going to give my all every single day when, when stuff like that's happening every single day? Hey Amen. What do you got? Well, before we got on, we were talking a little bit about <laughs> the hunting world and the women out there. And, uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> you know, unbutton the blouse and uh, yeah. pull on the Daisy Dukes. and uh, Tight skin clothes. 
Now, you've been out there, and, uh, of course, M Melinda has. And, uh, you know, that's always a hot topic. Yeah. And I know we've been hitting a lot on social media, but I really want to hear your opinion on the that. The hunting bunnies and the gun bunnies. You know, man, it's it's just one of those things where you, you – there's so many people in the industry, and, and there's some great – people out there that are doing the industry such a great justice, people that put in the time, that actually uh, train and get out there and aren't necessarily showing everything about themselves. Like they, they, wanted, they wanted to be organic. They don't want to use their body to get attention, to, to get sponsorships. And I think that's what's wrong nowadays. There's a lot of these females that say they're hunters. They get naked and next thing you know, they get so many sponsors by so many people and they ruined it in the hunt industry because you have guys that guys and gals that that legitimately love the industry want to do things like um like andy and, mm -hmm. and like um john dudley and cameron haynes and all these guys that have put in the time and the work you know they've been at it for years and all of a sudden you know that they, they they're raising up in the community and people are like well we know who these guys are and they have busted their ass and then here you go, you have a young girl who's attractive, who wears very tight clothes, shows her breasts, shows her ass, and has the same paycheck and same stuff as the guy that's been doing it for 15 years, and she has no clue what she's doing. I blame the companies. That bothers me. I blame the companies. That bothers me because I, there's been so many times that I've approached certain companies. I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a sponsorship. This is what I do. This is my resume. And they're like, oh, we're not taking anybody right now. And then... Two, three days later, they, they post this gun bunny out Yeah, we got Susie Big Ass. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh God, I'm glad I didn't get involved with you guys. I'm oh, Let's get Melinda's perspective. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. I, I Super emotional, I know. I know. I know. I, know. I, I, like I, I, I hear you. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, none of my boobies are hanging out or <laughs> you don't see any skin on me. But um, We're on TV. You're covered. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I just want to want to say thank you for coming here. Oh, I'm so pleasure. Thanks for having me. Emotional, inspirational. Um, but I think everybody in here and a few people out there know that I love to hunt. Oh, yeah. And um, you're checking out some of my animals. But I was. Can I take some of those home? Oh, no, no. no, no. <laughs> no. Well. You can look at them. You can even touch them. I want oh, you to touch them. Just moving the ram, she got weird. <laughs> So, you know, um, when you told me the story or when you told all of us the story about you um, taking your, your, your friend's son out, um, I think that was probably one of the stories that hit me because I think people want to give back and they want to do something, but um, they don't ever really know what to do. Yeah. So when I see and hear that you do something like that, it kind of makes me want to just grab everyone around me and just go on a hunting trip. <laughs> but so with you, so of all the hunts that you can go on now that the water buffalo, I got to tell you, 35 yards with a bow. You saw my reaction, right? You saw my reaction. I about fell off the chair because I'd probably shit myself. <laughs> Um, I got close. Yeah. <laughs> Up in the tree. Oh, yeah. Um, but um, I'd like to know, what would you really love to do that you haven't been able to hunt, that you haven't been able to go on, um, and who would you bring? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, obviously, I'm always... John Bartolo. Just, just, just so you know. John Bartolo. <laughs> Screw John Bartolo. Bring me. <laughs> I'm cuter. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, I'm not very specific or well animal. I mean, I do have a list of what I want to, what I want to kill. Tell the zebra story. <laughs> the one for him, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I definitely bring somebody special with me, whether it be a gold star kid or another wounded guy or, or, or somebody in the law enforcement community or, or something along those lines that needs to get out, that needs to experience, that, that just needs to get in the outdoors and get around like-minded people and just have a good time with no agenda, no cameras, no pictures, none of that. Just, hey, we're going to go hunting and that's it. And um, So I don't know. Um, I, was, uh, I was eyeing your, your grizzly bear, so I think that's... That's probably one, um, or maybe just go back to uh, to Alaska and hunt some uh, um, 
What's polar bear. No. 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 Um, Yeti. Dang it. What's Yeti. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, what's the dang deer out there? Uh, the coos deer? Those no. Uh, caribou. Okay. Oh. Caribou. I want to go caribou hunting so bad. Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't been able to get on one. But, yeah, something like that. I mean, it, honestly, it doesn't have to. I don't really care. But, yeah, those are definitely on my list. And I don't know. Something like Bring somebody special for sure. And I think what happens is people don't understand. They think it's just about the kill, but it's the whole experience that leads up to it. And one of the, the calmest moments that I have is right when I'm looking down the scope and everything's really quiet. Yeah. And you just, you have to concentrate on your breathing. And all of a sudden you get, I get, I sometimes every once in a while, a lot, I get like the buck fever where you oh, start yeah. to shake a little. Oh, I your still get it. I get it. starts at your toes and it starts going up and you're just like, Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. And then, um, and then, but that's probably my most favorite moment yeah. of any hunt is that one second right before you pull the trigger. Because you shut everybody off. Every, everybody in the world at that moment does not matter. It's just you, that. And I think in a way you find a sense of peace that carries through you for the rest of the year. So you get to do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what's very special about hunting. Not, not to mention, you know, conservation and, and what we do for for it and, and how we're able to take a mature buck to make way for a younger buck Absolutely. to breed, to, mm -hmm. to make better deer. Um, so I don't think people realize that. And then, you know, it's not like we kill it and we leave it and we just mount it. It's like, no, that meat comes home. Mm -hmm. I eat it. Like, I, I cook like crazy. Like I, if you ever see my That's page, so or it, <laughs> yeah, my my girl is always like, you always cook. I'm like, mm -hmm. I know, but like I'm always cooking um, stuff on the trigger, like whether it be, you know, backstrap, or I'll come up with different things, or I'll just go to the, the just go to my freezer and see what I got, and then mm -hmm. I'll Google stuff and come up with new recipes and try it. And and I feel like there's nothing better than eating game meat because I know where it came from. I know what that animal is eating. It doesn't have any steroids. Mm -hmm. None of that crap that they pump into these animals to make them six, 700 pounds in two months. Like none of that. It's just clean source protein. And that's what I love about it. So um, a lot of people have given me shit because one of the things, before, <laughs> I, before I even tell you what my favorite game meat is or one of them, um, oh. you, you know what? Mountain lion. Really? If you've never had it, I'm going to get so much shit on this. I haven't. Who cares? I um, want to try it. It is It is so good. It is really? like the other white, white meat. Huh. I think I have a mountain lion hunt in Utah mm -hmm. next month. So, so Is that the one with Andy? Uh, no, that's in Texas. No, no, not in Texas. This is one's in Utah um, with another friend. So if I do get one. So... It, you have to make, you have to take it home and yep. try it because it's like eating pork chops. Really? And I can't believe I'm actually saying this on air because you know I'm going to get some shit right, JB. <laughs> you thought you had some haters? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. My, my haters actually help my cause at this point. People get it. I'm, I'm interesting. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to be, they're going to think I'm a killing bitch. They're going to hate, yeah. yeah they're going to think you're a murderer. Whatever. I haven't got that yet. Yeah, um, and, but that's one of my favorite, and it's weird because you know I'm half Asian, half Irish, and, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Oh yeah, huh?" That's sure. why <laughs> you, you eat dog too. Like, uh, come on, come on. Come. Uh, and so that's you know, Korean. <laughs> <laughs> that was John Bartolo. In that to all the Koreans yeah, who are listening, yeah. that was John Bartolo. Come after him. Yeah. No, um, you know, but I mean, the thing is. There's so many different ethnic stuff. Like if you go and you travel, and there's so many things that are out there that people don't experience. Mm -hmm. And when you actually open up, open up your mind a little bit, then it's easy to do because you have um, you have the ability to say, okay, I'll try that. I'll yeah. try that guinea pig over there. Yeah, why not? When I'm down in Peru, yeah, and hope that I don't get sick. I didn't exactly. And it was okay. Yeah. And I don't know if I would do it again. But the thing is, it's really cool to see that somebody like you is inspiring people. Really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things that I think you ought to try things. Like, you know, you look at a guinea pig here in the States and it's, it's a pet. pet. <laughs> but somewhere else in the world, it's a source of food. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's keeping them alive. That's keeping their family alive. It's feeding their kids. So just because we live in such a modern country doesn't mean that we can't go back to the ways that our ancestors were brought here. 
You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I, I've always been down to try anything. And there's been things that I've liked and there's things that I haven't liked. And it's just, it's part of that. Like, mm -hmm. I think we need to step outside of the grocery store and quit buying the same crap and go try something else. Like, really enjoy the outdoors. Wait a minute. You mean the stuff in the grocery store is killed? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. It just miraculously yeah, it just appears. I thought it just showed up. It grows on trees. Yeah. You, you do know that people have told me, and like they send stuff on my IG, they're like, you know what you should do? Just go to the grocery store like everybody else. You shouldn't kill animals. Because that's uh, healthy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. It, one word, Monsanto. But we're always going to get that. Yeah. That's never going to stop. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for, for so long. I mean, the simple fact that, that they have an organization like PETA is just insane. And, and in some ways, I understand what they do. You know, when it comes to dogs and cats and all this mm -hmm. stuff that I mean, oh, the dog years. shit. Yeah, like I, I, oh, I one hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, like a baby. I'm telling you, like mm -hmm. stuff like that really matters. But when you're coming after hunters who are actually feeding money back into into our communities, they don't understand. It's a multi-billion-dollar business. Mm -hmm. Every single year, we're buying hunting license, and that money goes back into the state for conservation, and we're releasing more animals, and we brought more animals back into uh, out of extinction like do people not realize that this is like i was talking to e like black buck and um axis deer in mm -hmm. texas were brought in the 70s from india and they were slowly dying in india and the ranchers uh single-handedly brought back that breed took it back to india and it's out of extinction now that they're back to the numbers that they used to be. Same thing in, in Africa. You know, we, we mm -hmm. have a bunch of animals here that were dying over there. Now they're, they're back to the numbers. And people don't see that. It's just like we do a lot of great things. Don't, 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 don't give hate us that, what you don't know. Exactly. Don't give mm -hmm. us that stigma that we're just here to kill, 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 and we're going to kill anything just to kill it. It's, it is not how it works. Like hunters are very ethical people mm -hmm. and they're not going to kill a buck just to kill a buck like yes. there's so much to it like i don't think people grasp what it is that we do for the hunting industry and what we do for those animals to keep them around for generations to come there's a funny line on youtube somebody said the animals commit suicide to get in the grocery store <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny i like that one yeah, suicide so we've covered so i'm gonna wait one, one oh, more no, thing no. i'm gonna give this back to aaron because you're the first person that i've actually come up and said anything to oh that's we were, awesome. we, i was trying not to Thank make a big you. deal of it melinda <laughs> i know i'm like a nerd uh, with Nelly. I don't i'm glad you did yeah me too you, that's you know, awesome it was great so i just even branch to couldn't get her up here no <laughs> nobody can get me up here but, um, I, uh, know, I feel honored you know, i love you branch <laughs> <laughs> but, um, thank you again thank you so we've covered so much, and I know it's getting it's getting long. We want to get some lunch in you and, and wrap with you a little more. I want to get into you, you. You toured the facility. You saw everything we do here. Yeah. And we're going to get into Black Rifle and some of the other companies you love working with. What do you love about what you've seen so far here and what we're doing? And I know we threw a lot at you. It was like a fire hose. You're going to have more time to kind of sit around and do it. You know, I saw you very comfortable in that gun room. You were super comfortable sitting back there. Can I sleep there tonight? Seriously. Uh, we're actually, you know, we should put some cots back yeah, there. Yeah, you should. Uh, I'm not sure. I've been saying it. I've been yeah. saying it for a while Dude, now. A I'm, not, I'm not sure our controller, Tactical Terry, will allow cots You can put a, a cot room. in a refrigerator, and I'm good. Yep, She'll be running exactly. around cameras and liability. Um, <laughs> what do you love? You know, you, you got a fire hose approach. What do you love about what we're doing here? What do you hate? What do you like? What have you seen? Man, honestly, um, just talking to a few friends, I was excited to come up here because I've been a huge fan of the 300, uh, of that Petra, man. I was like, I, I need to get my hands on it. I want to shoot one so bad. And, um, you know, that's, that's what my expectation was coming here, is just touching that gun. But, you know, getting the tour and seeing behind the scenes and what's going on and, and putting my hands on stuff that um, people haven't seen yet was pretty awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm there's excited. a few toys coming. Yeah, I'm excited for that. I was like, ooh. And... And just to, to see the way that everything operates here and how smooth it is, and and, and not to mention, and, and I, this is, shouldn't shouldn't matter, but the amount of veterans that are here and what you guys do for the veteran community and 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 everything that you guys do behind the scenes for the veteran community is awesome. Like Jason's dad's a veteran. I don't know if you guys have ever mentioned that before, but that's pretty cool to see. You know, um, seeing someone that that's done a great service to our country and and then their son 
makes it a priority to take care of the veteran community and do stuff in the veteran community. It's awesome to see because at the end of the day, Jason, you guys don't have to do a damn thing for the veteran community at all. You don't know anything to the veteran community because what we do is not to get free hats, free shirts, free guns, none of that, not even a thank you because what we do at the end of the day, it's a job. And it, it's a job that we love to do. And if nobody were ever to thank us, I think we continue to do the job. But you guys doing what you do for for the community, it's greatly appreciated. And I just wanted you guys to know that. So. I appreciate that. And um, you got to get your hands on some stuff. You love the wind mag. You got to see the pistol, the standard, some of the some of the things we've been rolling out. And you got yeah. to see some secret squirrel stuff. I did. That was fun. Are you excited about what's coming? I am. Um, I really am. I can't wait to uh, take a couple of those things out hunting. What? Is that, okay? can we say that? Are we hunting? What am I looking at? You want to see my face? Oh. <laughs> I thought, I thought we, were gonna, we were going to release some secret squirrel information. Oh, are we, I got, I like, are we really I got excited. Yes. I thought we were going to have an exclusive. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have some great stuff coming, and uh, I, I, w I was hoping Mel was going to let us quiet. I mean, it, it's it's not a secret, some stuff that we have coming. You got to get your hands on some of it. I'm really excited. This is, you know, 2018, I did a lot of the things that I kind of wanted to do out of the gate here and kind of did some different versions of some existing things and made some changes in the infrastructure and in the building and, and the culture. Yeah. 2019 is really going to be Jason's time to get some stuff that he wants to get done. Nice. And a lot of the stuff coming is representative of what he's wanted to do for a while. And everybody knows it's not a secret. He's a big-time precision guy, big-time big long-range guy. Um, That's where we get along so good. Yeah. You know, I, I prefer the intimacy up close. <laughs> I'm a cuddler. I'm a cuddler. Uh, you know, all this, this size, I have to put it to use, right? <laughs> so I prefer, I prefer that. But that's what makes it great about working together and, and having the team structure we have and the, and the family approach. It's, it's a lot of fun, and I think you get the vibe. All of us are really close here. No, for sure. And in your, your words about the veteran community, don't go unnoticed. You know, we do... Um, Tony's course, which is a Leo sponsored course, yep. um, all law enforcement. Uh, we do it for those guys. It's a lot of fun. Jason comes down, I go down. We have a blast down there with those guys, all law enforcement guys. Ruben was in the course, a bunch of guys that have been out here. Awesome. And, you know, that's the stuff we love to support and get behind. And anything that supports those communities is something that's near and dear, I know, to his heart. And there's a lot that people don't see that gets done exactly and, and that's what i kind of i really really love about it is that it's not thrown out there it's not look at us look what we're doing it's just you know what hey get it done we don't care we see anything from it or or get any some sort of like social media thank you or shout out or anything so mm -hmm. that, that that's that's honestly it's one of the great things to see because not a lot of people do that i think a lot of people are in it to get some sort of gratitude from certain people for to feed their egos amen and as we get close to closing, uh, give us some of the companies you work with that you love. Tell us a little bit about some of your relationships and uh, where people can find you and where people can get more information on having you speak or having you work with them. Yeah. And give us a little rundown. Hey, not to jump in real quick. We had a couple questions on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. People want to know, like, they loved your story. Was there some sort of charity or way to, like, help donate, help support that cause? Give them the routing charity. number in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, if you ship me uh, a Vemo. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, man, there's a few um, nonprofits that I truly support. Um, Sons of the Flag being one of them. Sons of the Flag was started by a friend of mine who was a former Navy SEAL who was blown up overseas and was suffered minor burns. And when he came home and he saw that there's nothing going on um, to better um, surgeries for, for burn victims, he kind of took it upon him, and he, he's doing research to uh, find better quality, better doctors for, for burn people. And it's not only for, for service members. It's for uh, our, our, our police, our, our firefighters, and civilians. So if you guys can go check them out, they're Sons of the Flag. They're doing amazing things. I assume it's www.sonsoftheflag.com? Dot org. Dot org? Yeah. Okay. Org. So where can everyone find you? What companies do you work with and, and what relationships do you have? What do you want to plug? Um, you know, Crispy11B on, on any social media. 
And man, you know, I, I get to work with some amazing companies. Um, my, three of my best friends own uh, Black Raffle Coffee, so I, I get to do stuff with them. I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people see me on the videos. And the stuff, caffeinated but, life. Yeah. So you know, we get to make a bunch of funny skits and make people laugh. And those are good, and, great guys. I mean, I've always admired their media. Like I told you, I haven't um, spent a lot of time with those guys, but yeah. they do a great job. No, they do, man. So companies like that, like. You know, Silencer Co. has been amazing to me. And anything that I that I get involved with, um, you know, how some of these hunts that I do with these kids, they're, they're so quick to get behind it and then help me and, and and just never ask for anything. They just want to help. So, you know, man, there's a ton of companies that I do stuff with that are amazing. But, you know, those are the ones that are kind of sticking out to me right now. They do great, great things. Sure. So social media, the best is to DM you or do you want an email address or... Um, I think on all my social medias, you can click on the email. And that's and, the best and, way. And, yeah, and it shoot it over to me. Shoot so, you an email. Yeah. Um, the most effective way to slide in is don't send nudes. What do you? Yeah. <laughs> my girl. Be just, short, concise, tight. My girl's Cuban. If you try, she will find you. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to, what is it, Jason? She will find you. She, she will, will find, kill you. I will, kill you. <laughs> I will find you. So slide in there and, um, you know, get make it short and sweet i'm sure you get a million messages so yeah i mean don't be offended if i don't get to you uh right away but i will try to get to you beautiful um do we cover everything do we miss anything the only thing i want to ask real quick yeah. is is how i'm taking dude stop it no oh, oh, <laughs> we were in the we were in the army not the navy <laughs> no offense to any navy personnel no offense to andy <laughs> or, yeah. or andy yeah. yeah um one thing i want to touch on is uh you made it a point to go back and, and uh, reattach yourself with those guys coming back from overseas. You yeah. know, like you went out of your way to go to Germany. Um, I had kind of like the sim similar experience with uh, our medic got shot in the face while in Iraq. And so I, me and a good buddy of mine, Duff, like we hopped in the car and went to Walter Reed like as soon as we got back. And uh, how important is it for us to reconnect to our brothers? Um, and how impactful is it? And how, how meaningful is that to you? You know what? I think it's... Um it's not even a question of doing it. I think it's part of the brotherhood. It's something that, that it's embedded in us. It's part of our DNA. And you just want to make sure that that guy that had your back is okay. And, but, you know, staying in touch um, with every single guy that you serve, I think is very important. And to reach out to new people that you, that you didn't serve with, but might've been around the same AO as you were. You know what I mean? It's, it's just the, you, you got to stay active with those guys because they're your family, man. At the end of the day, they may not share the same blood, but those men and women do. They're part of your life. They're your family, and you got to make sure that they're okay at all times. And that's what I love about social media, man. I'm able to keep up connection, connected with a lot of these guys. And um, along the way, I've met a lot of people that I stay in touch with. Um, I was fortunate enough to go back to Iraq three years after I was wounded, fly over the spot where I was injured, and the PSD group that that um, escorted me around and, and all that was amazing. Got to go to Afghanistan and speak to the troops. You know, I spoke to Marines, Air Force, Airmen, everybody. And um, it was amazing. You know, I still keep in touch with a lot of guys that are over there and they still keep in touch with me. So it's just, it's such a great community, man, because we're, we're a family. We're not even a community, we're a family. And it doesn't matter what branch, it really doesn't. Um, we're just a huge family, but I think it's important to always stay in touch with everybody. I um I know we ran a little long. I want to give, as we wrap, I want to give a special thanks to Ilio from Blue Line Tactical. Yes, I'm giving you a special thanks. Who? Exactly. <laughs> He's a, he, he was a little flustered last night at dinner. You, are you talking about my bodyguard? Oh, your fault. He lost a juju bead. <laughs> 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 but he, no, seriously, thank you. I appreciate it. This was a great story. Getting getting Omar out here was awesome. Your Montana is beautiful. I've never been here before, and I'm I'm, I'm blown away. Well, you could always well, just do. Back. You could always just do a lonesome dove. And just no. just transplant yourself up to no, Montana, from Texas. Sir. It's all right. I would okay. never leave Texas. Come on, go. I'll, I'll so, call it. <laughs> no, I'll fly out here as much as you want me to. I'm not really leaving Texas. Keep so. rooting for those cowboys. They need it. <laughs> so, I thank you for coming out and Thanks sharing your me. story and spending some time with us. It means a lot to me, personally and professionally, to have someone of your character, of your caliber, out Thank here you. and spend time with us and get to know us and get to know what we're doing here. 
And I know it means the world. I, I know I definitely speak for Jason and Melinda. It means the world to them. Thank you. Thank um, you. Not just because you're a disabled veteran, not because of your service, but because of the character that you bring to everything that you do. Thank you. It's inspiring to watch. And I mean that. So you're welcome here anytime. Appreciate it. You're a guest of Falcor. You're going on every hunt from now on with a Petra. That's for <laughs> fucking damn sure. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm looking forward to hopefully having a great relationship with you and with, with Falcor. For sure. Absolutely. I think it's already there. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank everybody on YouTube who took the time to pay attention and listen to the story. Uh, please take some time to share it. You know, Omar's story, I don't think he's ever been that candid, at least that I've seen with some things. Um, please take a minute to share it and uh, support everything that he's doing and everything that he's putting out there. And uh, we'll get to housekeeping items and, and wrap up and thank the sponsors. We are giving away yeah. a, a 454 Casul. I want it, by the way. Yeah, it's pretty slick. <laughs> It's an eleven hundred dollar value. David was texting me. So. Yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty good. A uh, pretty good chunk of change. Nice, you know. nice little bear dropper, yeah. panty yeah. dropper, oh, yeah. maybe. panty dropper, panty yeah. dropper. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Aaron, and why don't you wrap it up? You and Derek take take the wheel, and, and we'll close out. Cool, uh, Omar. Thanks again for thanks, uh, showing up, man. It, it was it was awesome having you. Uh, yeah. So huge thanks to our th our sponsors, uh, Kinsey's Optics again. Always uh, excellent glass. Big Bang Energy. Always keeping uh, John up and up and never uh, being down and out. 221B Tactical, very excellent stuff. Mark Bell Slingshot, keeping us all, especially Jason, nice and fit. You know, he's that nicer t shirt he's got going on. The model. On. Yeah, the model. And uh, Taurus, as a matter of fact, we have a giveaway of the Taurus Raging Bull for 454. Uh, if you uh, share what we have, a little hunting little sidearm. Hunting sidearm, you know. Uh, bear killer, panty dropper, like we like used penny to say. Dropper. And uh, on that note, I'll give it back to uh, Derek. All right, guys. Uh, we've got on the screen right now, you can see the different networks we have available where you can watch and subscribe. So on iTunes, we do have a video feed and a separate audio feed. We're trying reviews. to go, Yeah, we need reviews on those channels. So please, if you're an Apple guy, drinking the Kool-Aid, go over there, make sure you give us a review and definitely post your IG handle in those comments as well, which will also enter you into future giveaways as well, just by having your IG handle in those comments. So please take a second for that. For the rest of you, Droid users, everybody else who's been really wanting to see this on other networks, be sure to check us out. We've got Anchor, uh, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Spotify, what are the other ones? YouTube, Stitcher. Radio Public, Stitcher, and of course, Pocket Casts. Probably many more coming soon, but right now you can pretty much find us anywhere. So definitely check out those those feeds we have set up for you. Now, to enter the giveaway, make sure that you subscribe to one of these. doesn't really matter which one. And then head over to our Behind the Flame Instagram and then post which one you subscribe to. For those of you that don't have Instagram, I've seen some of you say you don't have Instagram. I don't know what's going on, but go ahead and comment in our YouTube feed as well. So you can comment in the live feed now. When this video ends, you'll be able to comment down below as well. We'll be checking all of those for your chances to win. So Aaron, I'm going to throw it back to you real quick for the last closing remarks. Thanks again for watching, everybody. And here's Aaron. Thanks for watching, folks. As a matter of fact, uh, thank you, Derek, for being such a good uh, voice of the gods. And on that, on that note, we'll catch you guys later. Love you. Deuces.